So Joe, I noticed that recently this topic of income inequality mm -hmm. seems to be all over the news. The president's been talking about it as a sort of a touchstone of his second term. Right. The new very left-wing mayor of New York City has called it a priority. Uh, even the Pope has been out there right. speaking publicly about income inequality. So I'd like to just ask you sort of generally, mm -hmm. what would be an Austrian perspective on this? How should we think about the topic as it's being presented in the news? Uh, I think the Austrian perspective is one in which we distinguish between inequality that's generated by consumers and consumer demand and inequality that's uh, generated by what we might call government income plundering. So let's take the case of, of the first type of inequality generated by consumer demand. Uh, the reason why, for example, Sam Walton, um, Steve Jobs, mm. uh, Bill Gates, and going back a ways, Ray Kroc, who, who was the founder of, of McDonald's, why they became multimillionaires and billionaires was because they produced products efficiently that best serve consumer wants. So consumers determine their incomes. Now, if we move on to government plundering, um, what happens is uh, governments tax and they take those revenues and they take a cut for themselves and, and, and the bureaucrats and then they distribute them. They distribute them to different firms. They distribute them in the form of subsidies, contracts, and bailouts. So companies like um, agribusiness companies like Mans Monsanto, uh, defense companies, uh, United Technologies, Honeywell International, Halliburton, and, and company, you know, financial institutions like AIG and Citibank, they are all the recipients of incomes that have result, you know, that result from this income plundering. So that puts another layer of inequality on the market, or actually changes how incomes uh, are, um, we might use the word distributed, but, but on the market, incomes really aren't distributed. Well, I'll, I'll make a point about that later. Okay. Now, earlier this week, we had a piece as a Mises Daily right. article by Frank Hollenbeck talking about how central banks, in particular our Federal Reserve, caused huge amounts of, of wealth disparity. And Tom Woods has written about this as right. well. But there seems to be sort of a blind spot in the media because both the left and the right seem to be in favor of central banks and the Fed generally. So can you talk a little bit about how uh, conceptually and also mechanically how a central bank creates wealth inequality in, in the U.S.? Yeah, what, what happens is that um, it really starts with government deficits. Governments always want to spend more than they take in. When they increase their spending, their constituencies are, are benefited, and they get more votes, the administration in power, and so on. So increasing spending is great. But if you increase taxes to finance that spending, what you're going to find is that the, uh, you know, the populace becomes, uh, you know, uh, they recognize this as, as taking money directly from them and putting it into the pockets of others. So there's a third way, or rather a second way, and that is to run government deficits. Mm -hmm. And when you, the government runs deficits, it will drive interest rates up if it borrows directly from the public. And that has its own negative effects on the public. It, it becomes more expensive to buy houses and automobiles and so on. So finally, we have the Fed, the central bank. Um, if the Fed finances those deficits by buying government bonds, either directly or in, in, in the case of the United States, they can only buy them indirect, indirectly, uh, that keeps interest rates down. Right. It also serves to allow the government to spend more money than it's taking in tax revenues. When that happens, the new money gets into the system through the banking system for the most part. And that expands credits, expands the amount that banks can, can lend. And the money flows through credit markets. It benefits those who receive it first. It, it benefits the banks themselves, who now have reserves created out of thin air that they can now loan out at interest. It, it, it causes a lot of interest gyrations, exchange rate gyrations, and so it benefits hedge funds and other types of, of firms. So you have a lot of, of, of um, hedging against movements in interest rates and, and exchange rates that would never occur on a market um, that, that was based on, on a gold standard or sound money of some type. Okay. Well, so Frank Hollenbeck identifies this process right. that central banks engage in as almost a reverse Robin Hood. You, you mentioned uh, sort of the early recipients of newly created right. Fed uh, monetary right. in expansion. Uh, talk about the effect on the late recipients, in other words, the inflation tax and, and how the Fed process punishes savers and how that adds to it. Sure. So, so what happens is that the, the, the money that is, is either loaned at low, low interest rates 
to, um, to, to you know, financial firms and so on, and they loan the money out. Um, or it's, it's, it's paid in uh, the form of government contracts, subsidies, and so on to, to firms. Now, those firms are able to use those funds um, to purchase things before prices have risen, before there has been an inflation. So they benefit. They're the early recipients that you just talked about. Um, they then pay their workers who also benefit because most prices have not gone up yet. Their stockholders received higher dividends and so on and capital gains, and they're able to spend the money be prior to an, a general increase in prices. Eventually, though, let's say Joe Salerno sitting in New York City on a fixed in, uh, um, or on, on uh, uh, an income that's uh, given by a university, which doesn't change very frequently, changes once a year, um, though I see prices going up all around me. Right. And so do other people whose incomes aren't initially affected by the new money. And so they're paying higher prices for 12 months, 18 months. Eventually, their incomes will rise and will catch up. But during that t period of time, the real purchasing power of their incomes have actually shrunk. Because if prices have gone up by 10%, they can purchase 10% less. Even if they catch up 16 months later, 18 months later, they have lost real income during that 18-month period. So, so they, they, were, they were victimized by this inflationary process. So obviously, there, there are particular Austrian viewpoints on this. When Mises was writing Socialism, his treatise, which I believe he wrote in the, finished in the early 30s. Of course, that was a time of great upheaval. And he described sort of the socialist left's obsession with this income equality as what he called an ethical postulate. In other words, uh, saying that the left, the socialist left at the time, in Europe and, and also later in America had sort of a, a big blind spot and made a grave error with respect to not understanding the cost of income equality, so-called, and that cost being that you have a total amount of income in a country, and right. you can't just assume that you can divide that up differently and that the to total amount of income won't shrink right. as a result. Yeah, so you have to take a step back. What the left sees uh, and, and what, what, what the Marxist-oriented economists of the 1930s saw was, or believe they saw, was that there was a distribution process under the market, that, that um, income could be distributed either fairly or unfairly. But the point is, with the market, there is no distribution of income. So, for example, if I hire a babysitter for 20 hours a week and pay her $10 an hour, then there's only production and exchange. There's no distribution. There's no separate distribution process. All that has happened is that she's produced 20 hours of babysitting services and exchanged them for $10 an hour or $200. There is no distribution. The distribution occurs when the government taxes away, let's say, one third of her $200 and then distributes it to agribusiness, to defense contractors, and so on. So the distribution process comes in with, with, with uh, the government. Now, to get to your other point, um, in, if, you, if you begin to, to tax and uh, incomes, what happens is that you, you set up a system of, of incentives and disincentives. You, you raise costs to firms. Firms produce less. Workers will work less if, if they're, they're taxed. Investors will, will find that a lot of their investments are being taxed away, and it's not worth the risk to invest. So what's going to happen is that you're going to have a shrinking pie. Okay, so you're not just going to get the distribution, but you're also going to get, uh, it's really a zero, rather a negative sum game. It's not just a zero sum game. Um, and, and the socialists don't understand that. Well, when we're making the case for markets, yes. uh, we like to consider the, the notion that entrepreneurs put capital at risk and that they create goods and services that benefit all of society, all of mankind, and some of them uh, lose all, lose everything. Right. Others create things like iPhones and Cadillacs and things that we right. all want and become very wealthy in the process. So we like to think of this in terms of sort of creative destruction uh, and, right. and new technology that benefits us. But today we find ourselves in an age that a lot of people view as more crony capitalism. In other words, we have subsidies, we have bailouts, we have a lot of regulatory capture. Yes. So as Austrians, how do we sort of make the distinction between government favoritism, which creates inequality of wealth, the Fed process you talked about earlier, and, and favorable inequality of wealth, which derives from entrepreneurs taking risks and, and making society better off. Yes, I mean, look, any investment is, is a risk. It's a leap into the not completely unknown future, but into a future that's uncertain, let's say. So, for example, when um, IBM was riding high in the 1960s and 1970s, 
Um, and their president at the time, uh, uh, his name may have been Watson, uh, when they already had the technology for personal computers. And uh, you know, he made a statement that, well, this will never go anywhere. This will only be um, a household toy or uh, you know, a, a way to keep your, uh, you know, uh, your budget in, in a household. It'll never spread to business. Um, companies like Apple said, that's wrong. I don't care if the biggest company in, in, you know, the biggest tech company is, is, is not taking a bet on that. I'm going to take a bet on that. And eventually, IBM almost went out of business in, in, in 89 and 90, suffering the largest losses up to that point for an industrial, for a uh, in, you know, private industrial company. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas Apple, Microsoft, Intel, who had taken the bets uh, that, that the, the tech industries would be changing, they, they, they earned high profits. The point is, was that, if that lure of profits were not there, would they have gone up against IBM? I don't think so. And the consumers would have been much poorer for it all. And so would business and, and productivity and investment that, that this, this high tech revolution brought about. Well, it's interesting. You know, Mises talked about economics, or described economics as a value-free science as, in terms of methodology and outlook. But when, we're, but when we're talking about income inequality, it almost seems that a lot of our statements and assumptions are very value-laden, and they're full of ethical components. So is it important for us as Austrians to sort of separate our economic analysis from our value judgments and our value prescriptions about how society ought to look? Sure. I mean, I mean, I think it's important just to stress that income inequality in the positive sense is a part of the market. That is, as consumers change their demands for various products, they are the ones that create the winners and the losers. They are the ones that create high incomes for, for let's say, tennis players and lower incomes for a pizza delivery men. Uh, there is no, no one else is there distributing something. We don't just produce all goods and throw them into a pile and then distribute them, okay? It's consumers and their demands and, and, and they're abstaining from buying certain products and buying other products that creates this income inequality. If you try to interfere with that, you're really interfering with the price system. You're changing relative prices and you're distorting the market. Um, on the other hand, I think we don't have to make a value judgment that that's good or bad, but if you're in favor of prosperity, I think as an economist you can say, then you're in favor of the in income inequality generated by the market. You are not in favor of income plundering that is generated by government where income is taken from some people and distributed to other people. That is a, a negative sum game. That, that leads to um, poverty, impoverishment. Um, it leads to um, degeneration of the capital stock. It's not replaced. And it just, it just leads to a, an economy that is um, regressing and not progressing. So Joe, to wrap up, let's go a little bit deeper into this concept of government plundering. Can you sort of define it a little more deeply and give us some examples? Yes. Um, the word plundering, used in this sense, comes from Frederick Bastiat, the great 19th century free market economist. Uh, we can think of it as, it as follows. Uh, there are producers in society, and we call them, they're the taxpayers. Without production, there, there could be no payment of taxes. And there are those who consume taxes, okay? And they're the government bureaucrats and, and, and the, favorite, the favored firms of politicians and bureaucrats. They're the ones that receive the subsidies, bailouts, and contracts. So the plundering occurs when, when, when government takes money from, from the producers, from the, from the, 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 the taxpayers, and, and distributes that money to tax consumers. These people do not earn their wages from, from, uh, and, and in other incomes from simply producing and exchanging. They, they earn it by having their hands out okay. to the bureaucrats and, and, and so on. Uh, let me give you an example of, 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 of the effect of, 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 of what we call a government plundering or income plundering. Uh, from 2000 to 2012, um, the real median household income uh, throughout the United States fell by 6% and stands, stands at about $51,000, um, again, at the end of 2012. In D.C., the real median household income, with all the poor people in D.C., it still went up by 23% to around $66,000. If you take the D.C. metro area, mm -hmm. which includes the Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia suburbs where the bureaucrats, contractors, and lobbyists live, 
it jumped up to $88,000. That's a difference between $88,000 and $51,000 for, 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 for median income for, for the country as a whole. Uh, and the, um, uh, that puts Washington, D.C., and its metro area at the top of the 25 most populous metropolitan areas, at the very top, um, for median household income. So that's, I think, is, is one example of, of how the market's distorted, how, how money always flows, how income flows to the imperial center, we might call it. Well, maybe the real uh, topic we should be discussing when it comes to income inequality is the inequality between federal government workers and average Americans. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's a good index. No, thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome.